Hello everyone, it's Chris Clark with DiscGolf.Law. What do the NHL, Star Wars, and the Grateful Dead all have in common? They all have entered into licensing deals with disc golf manufacturers. Recently, Prodigy announced a multi-year licensing agreement with the National Hockey League to become the first official disc golf partner of the NHL. Prodigy will produce and market an exclusive range of licensed products featuring the NHL Shield and all 32 team logos in Canada and the United States. Prodigy will also lead fan activations at various NHL events and venues throughout the 2023 and 2024 season. Now, disc golf and hockey do have some history. Casey DeSmith, uh, NHL player for the Vancouver Canucks has a dynamic disc sponsorship and has worn a hockey helmet with a disc golf basket on it in competition. Last year, the Philadelphia Flyers posted a promo for an event featuring their beloved mascot Gritty playing disc golf. There are other examples, particularly internationally. Disc golf is huge in Finland and hockey is as well. In 2017, Prodigy installed a disc golf course named after a Colorado Avalanche forward, Miko Rantanen, in his hometown, Nuisayanen. Also in 2019, Castaplast released a limited edition KK line of discs celebrating Finnish hockey player and New York Ranger Kapo Kako, who led the team to an upset victory over Canada in the 2019 Hockey World Cup. Apologies for butchering those names. So this NHL licensing deal is the most recent one, but we have had other big licensing deals in disc golf in the past. For example, in 2018, Discraft announced a licensing partnership with Disney's Star Wars franchise and released a limited run of official Star Wars discs. Then in May of 2023, Discmania signed an official merchandise license agreement with Grateful Dead Productions and released a run of discs featuring the iconic Steal Your Face and Dancing Bear logos. As I was considering this topic, another example came to mind, but I don't think it's really analogous to the others, and that is Arby's. This is one of my favorites. Arby's has in the past produced Arby's branded discs from Innova and Discraft and MVP and Prodigy, but to my understanding, that is not a licensing deal. If any of you out there have different information, please let me know, but I'm fairly sure that is just a situation where Arby's ordered discs from these manufacturers and had the Arby's logo and imagery stamped onto the disc themselves, and then Arby's just sold those discs from its website. At our law firm, we work on a lot of these types of licensing deals. We didn't work on any of the ones that I've discussed today, but I thought it might be helpful to talk through some of the basics of how these deals are structured. We start with one party that owns some type of valuable intellectual property. In these cases, it would be a valuable brand or some valuable images. That party that owns that intellectual property would be called the licensor. And then you have another party that wants to use those images or that valuable brand on their products. And that party would be called the licensee. So why would these parties want to enter into this type of legal arrangement? Let's start with the licensor, the one that owns the intellectual property. Licensing your intellectual property gives you the opportunity to expand into new areas. You can typically do this more quickly and at a lower cost than if you were to do it yourself. For example, it probably wouldn't make good business sense for Grateful Dead Productions to get into the business of manufacturing 
disc off discs. You would have to find a factory and source the materials and there's know-how involved and all this kind of stuff. Be much simpler and faster to partner with a licensee that already does that. Another reason is you can reach a potentially new audience by licensing your intellectual property in an area that you hadn't been in previously. For example, whether you're the NHL or the Grateful Dead or Star Wars, you may actually be able to reach a new audience through a licensing deal like this one. If you're a disc golfer, but not particularly a fan of the National Hockey League, this might be a way to get you interested in hockey but we can't overlook what's probably the most obvious reason that a licensor would want to do a deal like this. It amounts to a passive income stream for the licensor. And so when I say passive income, I mean, they're not really having to do any work in order to earn this money. They're just simply letting someone use their intellectual property and then collecting royalties. So why would a licensee want to do something like this? In some ways, it's sort of the other side of the same coin by putting in a team logos on disc golf discs and holding these special events at hockey games, for example, it gives the licensee, in our examples that would be the disc manufacturers, access to a whole new audience. Let's talk for a minute about what exactly is being licensed. In the legal world, when we think about an intellectual property license agreement, we're typically talking about patents, trademarks, and or copyrights. In these examples that I've been talking about, it's almost certainly not going to involve patents. Patents protect inventions, and that's not really the type of deal that we're working with here. Often the images that are being licensed amount to what we would call in the law a work of authorship. Works of authorship can be protected by copyright law. So it's likely that these transactions involve an element of copyright law. Not having worked on any of these particular deals, I can't say for sure, but I suspect it is by and large a trademark license agreement that we are dealing with here. A trademark identifies the source of particular goods or services. When we see these iconic images from the Grateful Dead or from Star Wars or from an NHL team, we immediately know it evokes in our mind, okay, yes, I know this is Star Wars or I know this is the Grateful Dead. Those source identifiers are what we refer to in the law as trademarks. In summary, this is probably primarily structured like a trademark license agreement and probably also includes some copyright elements as well. Inevitably, when I'm talking about deals like this, I am asked, so how much does it cost to license these Star Wars images or the NHL images or the Grateful Dead images? There's no way to know, but I can give you some general ideas about the way that the economics are structured. Typically in this type of deal, there will be an upfront payment. That chunk of money that you pay at the beginning of the deal can be treated in one of two ways. It could strictly just be an upfront license fee. Another possibility is it could be considered an advance against future royalties. That brings us to the second part of the economics of this deal, royalty payments. If that upfront payment is treated as simply just an upfront licensing fee, then royalties are paid on the first sale of whatever product it is that their intellectual property has been licensed to. Contrast that with a scenario where that upfront payment is an advance against future royalties. Let's just say, for example, that they paid a $50,000 advance. The first $50,000 in royalties don't have to be paid because they've already been paid in advance. Sometimes there may be just a strict royalty deal with no upfront payment, but that would be rare. Royalties are typically expressed as a percentage. So you say I'm getting a 10% royalty rate or a 12% royalty rate. It's very important in these types of deals to make sure it's clear what that is a percentage 
of? Is it gross sales? Is it net sales? Is it something else? If it's net sales, how is that calculated? These are all things that should go into a properly drafted intellectual property license agreement. There are also deals structured where it's just a dollar amount per unit that is sold. It's also important to clarify exactly what units the royalties will be paid on. Frequently manufacturers will send out free goods either for promotional purposes or to retailers so that retailers can check them out and get excited about these products. And so it's important to clarify in the licensing deal whether royalties are paid on all units or only units for which the licensee gets paid. Now, another question that we frequently get asked is about unauthorized use of some of these famous brands. Gateway Discs used to sell discs that had uh, the Michael Jordan Jumpman logo, even Grateful Dead and Star Wars. You can still find many of these out there on eBay and other marketplaces. Frequently, I'll see discs that have been dyed with a recognizable famous logo. Why aren't the owners of this intellectual property enforcing their rights against these individuals or manufacturers? Well, I think the answer is it really just doesn't make business sense. These folks have been flying under the radar and probably haven't really captured the attention of the owner of these brands. Even if they did capture their attention, it's very expensive to enforce your intellectual property rights against a third party. Not only are the legal costs associated with going after intellectual property infringers very high, but also as a practical matter, you would have to go and seize and destroy the infringing products. It can just become a very time-consuming and expensive process. And there may be a secondary reason as well. If you are the owner of a brand, you like for your brand to be out there and be seen by people. Is it really harming you if someone puts their favorite team logo on their disc or might it actually be helping you elevate your brand among the public? Many times I've heard people say when they see these infringing or unauthorized products out there, well, they must not be doing anything wrong, must not be breaking the law. It's technically not true. It's clearly infringement, but Asking whether it is or it isn't infringement is probably asking the wrong question. When does it rise to the level that something should be done about it? And when it reaches that level, what is a intellectual property owner do. Now that disc golf is growing and becoming more visible, we may see a little more enforcement on the part of these intellectual property owners. There is a risk for these companies that choose to ignore people who are infringing on their intellectual property. And I'm talking in particular about trademarks. You'll hear many trademark lawyers say that trademark owners have a duty to police the use of their mark. While it's technically not a legal duty, it is certainly smart and best practice. The risk is that if your mark is used without permission enough, it can eventually become diluted. Your mark loses its legal strength taken to an extreme that can ultimately lead to your mark becoming generic and not protected at all. It's important to understand that typically in these types of licensing deals, there are very strict requirements placed on the licensee in terms of how they can use these brands. Frankly, there's probably a lot of famous brand owners out there that just aren't interested in licensing their intellectual property to a disc golf company. Whether they may have some misperceptions about the culture of disc golf or maybe just disc golf isn't big enough yet, many brands, and rightly so, are very protective of their intellectual property and think carefully about whether or not to enter into these types of deals. So I'm curious to hear what you think. Are we gonna see more of these types of deals in disc golf? I feel like it's highly likely that we will. And if I'm right, what brands do you think would be a good fit for disc golf? Let us know and please like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.